Okay, how's everybody doing? Are you, I know we're running late today and we're all kind of punchy. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I was at Twitter for, my name's Oliver, first of all. Hi. Um, I was at Twitter for about four and a half years, uh, starting in 2010. Uh, and recently, about six months ago, left to go start a company called Buoyant. Just recently left to start a company called Buoyant. Um, and so it's both an adjective and a noun. How about that? Um, so this talk is uh, about kind of my history dealing with service discovery at Twitter. Um, I worked in and around that problem space very closely. When I started, I was the lead for observability. Um, so the monitoring, of the gr when you saw graphs in the Diffie talk, that's the stuff that I worked on. Um, and then I went into the traffic space, so kind of very close to the Finagle team, working on operationalizing the names and service discovery. And so I got a kind of front row seat to most of our service discovery outages over the past five years. Um, and let me tell you, there are many of them. Um, and we're gonna, so the talk is about that story and kind of set the context for the things Marius talked about this morning. Um, and if I talk too quickly, please slow me down. Um, so yeah, it's a story and we'll tie it all back to Finagle at the end, but it's really not about Finagle that much. <laughs> so we've heard this story a few times here about decomposing monoliths, right? When I joined in 2010, even before that, uh, Twitter had kind of acknowledged that they had this fail well problem it was very real, um, and if you used Twitter in 2010, you definitely saw it. Uh, that's what convinced me to come join, because they had problems to solve. And we had kind of you know, recognized already that we needed to get out of our monolith problem and move to a more nimble, what now is called microservice architecture. At the time, it was like, here's some Scala kids, go launch this somewhere else. Um, and so that, that's really what the story is about. Obviously, when you go to that world, you now have communication in a whole bunch of places you didn't before, uh, and so you have to do RPC. Um, bit of trivia, this is the original Finagle logo. Nobody really has seen that before, I think. Um, not, not everything around it, just this thing in the middle. Yeah. Um, and so service discovery is obviously, you've heard about this a few times today, uh, but it's kind of the predicate step to do RPC. I need to send my requests somewhere, right? Um, so where do I send them? Uh, and initially we had not really identified what service discovery was for. We had this place to dump host information, and so we used it for process enumeration. We expected it to be very consistent and authoritative, and over time, we really wanted to change those requirements, and that's what this talk's gonna be about. Um, and uh, as you've seen, it's kind of a fundamental underlying part of Finagle. You don't have to use it. You can give it Finagle a socket address, and it'll happily connect to that. Um, but to do this really in production, you want a more dynamic, flexible system under there. Uh, so when I joined, there were a few ways to do service discovery. Uh, the most common one was like a huge text file uh, with all the host names and hopefully ports uh, for the services. And then so like, you know, if I need to talk to the user service, I go ask the user service, hey, what's the, what host are you on? And I copy and paste that list and then somebody else finds the file in my directory and they copy and paste it, and pretty quickly that becomes a big configuration management problem. Uh, and we didn't really like that. Uh, we also had this machine database, it was great about telling us who, what teams owned what machines, um, but just because I own a machine doesn't mean I want it to serve traffic or any of those details. Uh, so that really wasn't a good solution either. Um, and there are some people, well, DNS, we'll talk about DNS in a second. Um, and there's some people who had kind of come out of Google, big surprise, who were like, oh, there's, there's a better way to do this. We're gonna use Chubby. Chubby's not open source, so we're gonna use Zookeeper. And so people had started playing with that. Um, a quick note on DNS. Uh, it's great, because it's everywhere, right? Everything speaks DNS to some degree. Uh, however, they all do it a little differently. They all kind of implement caching differently, and especially Java. If you've ever tried to like deal with DNS names in Java in production, you've encountered these flags and they are a headache, like a real big headache. Raise your hand if you don't think they're a headache. Great. Um, and, and we want a more live option, right? We want to be able to get updates about changes kind of quickly and not wait on DNS TTLs to propagate through the system. Furthermore, DNS is really a layer three solution. It doesn't really address layer four. Uh, you know, we don't really have port information in there. Serve records are there, they do cover this. Uh, client support is not great, especially in the JVM again. 
Uh, and so we, you know, we could go down the route of like implementing a bunch of DNS protocol stuff, um, but we were, we were kind of hipsters, so we used Zookeeper. And that kind of started looking like this. So I have a service that creates an ephemeral node in Zookeeper. It shoves some, you know, well, originally Thrift, but uh, eventually JSON blob in there that's just like, hey, here's the stuff I'm serving. Here are the ports I'm serving on, et cetera. And then some other service is just watching that directory and saying, hey, give me all the nodes in there. Uh, and when that works well, we get our PC, boom. Um, and yeah, and that's kind of what we had starting out. So uh, about the time I joined, there was one general purpose Zookeeper cluster. Everybody got to play in it. Everyone just chose their own directories and shoved JSON in there or Thrift in there. Uh, there were no ACLs. It was kind of you know, like, hey, our engineers are good. We don't make mistakes like that. Um, and there weren't that many services that had to use it. Most of them, again, were using static host lists and configuration files. Uh, but still some very wise people, um, actually the people who work on Aurora and Mesos started, like they realized that this would be a thing that would have to exist and they started to work on a server cell library, uh, which is still open source but is not the one that's used uh, in Finagle by default anymore. That looks something like this to instrument your code. So to register on the registration side, I would copy and paste this bunch of Java uh, I, you know, create a Zookeeper client. So now everything has to create a Zookeeper client. And then I uh, just register my endpoint in there. So we see some paths and some timeouts and all that stuff. Okay, great. Now we're caught up to when I joined Twitter. Um, so 2010 to about the time we went public, we were really fighting scaling issues uh, in production every day. Um, eventually they declared they killed the fail whale. Good. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it was a real learning experience and to be in, on call in that time was uh, really formative for a lot of us. Um, yeah. uh, so a big part of that are, are these things. So that story really wouldn't have happened as well as it did had it not been for things like Aurora and Mesos happening. Uh, that, they really enabled us to not have to go twist somebody's arm to get hardware, which is a big problem at Twitter for a long time. Uh, and so now I can automatically provision hardware. Great, uh, Finagle is also a big part of that story. Once you're in this world, you really need an RPC layer that deals with these problems for you and compensates for the complexity. So, service discovery then. No more static hostless, no more DNS. Zookeeper, oh my god, Zookeeper. Uh, this is not a talk about Zookeeper, by the way. It's just whatever that service discovery backend is, that thing's tough to maintain. Um, in that world, we have now a Zookeeper cluster per zone, per region and a whole bunch of processes talk to them and front ends discover these things via Zookeeper. Um, so now we are on a special, very special purpose cluster with observers set up in a you know, read-only replicas and all sorts of policy just to solve scaling Zookeeper for service discovery. We have other Zookeeper clusters that deal with other things. Um, so if you, and we have a lot more services talking to it. All right, Marius is no longer here, but I'm gonna make fun of him anyway. Um, so we're gonna talk about some horror stories done with that. Uh, so my favorite one, a manager thought he was talking to his local zookeeper on his laptop, he had a tunnel open, bam, all production gone. He removed all the nodes. Uh, that was a sev zero. Uh, that's the worst one. Um, in some cases, zookeeper goes down. Yangshu talked before about at Pinterest, you know, Zookeeper, like the leaders get all effed up, things can't write, and now we're dealing with stale data or things go really badly and everything just goes down and all the clients lose their state, they're flapping up and down, everything's crazy. So in Finagle, we introduced a lot of caching logic. If you look at the server set code in Finagle server sets, it's like, all right, as long as I have data, I won't change it, right? So if the, I lose my connection, I don't drop things out. It didn't do that initially. Initially, it just dropped out and you were screwed. Um, so we fixed that with caching. But then what happens when it comes back up and it's empty? Now I have like, everything's like, hey, it's telling me it's empty and you're waiting for everything to stand back up um, and that can take some time when everything is hammering this. The kind of lesson here is that Zookeeper clients are very hard to get right. Uh, and we weren't only dealing with the JVM, we were dealing with Python, we were dealing with Ruby and we were dealing with multiple implementations in each language to make things better. Who here has tried to use Zookeeper f at all before? Like writing a client, great. Do you know what this means? This is a state diagram for the session, for like Zookeeper's client session. This is a lot of stuff you have to manage to write a Zookeeper client. 
and it's very hard to get right. I've written one, and I'm an idiot for doing so. Um, but it, all of these kind of session expired connection loss cases are really hard, really, really hard to get right. Um, and so we want to minimize that. As somebody who is responsible for maintaining that library, we have a lot of stuff in people's code that does this, right? Now it's not like just something I can go deploy and fix. I have to go to every team, which is, again, hundreds to thousands of services, and say, hey, can you please upgrade? I fixed my bug in the Zookeeper client. Well, next time you deploy, you won't have an outage. More than that, we have a whole bunch of configuration, right? I have timeouts that deal with liveness. I have host names. I have paths in my code. And so we end up with a whole bunch of configuration just to manage different environments. Staging in this zone, prod in that zone, all of these things end up with different settings. And so we were investing a lot of time in like configs, uh, which we really wanted to get away from. And that's a big thanks to Marius. So as somebody who is on the team supporting this stuff, in a service-oriented architecture, I want to run service discovery just like any other team. I don't want this thick client that's in every service that I have to go, like, literally take months to upgrade. Like, I, I don't know how many work in a big company, but in big companies, things don't move quickly. Um, and as they grow especially, right, there are other priorities. And so we want to figure out how do we get out of the burden of upgrading other people's code. And so <laughs> uh, I don't know what the future is, but I want to kind of talk about some of my lessons here. Right? Like I, I'm not going to prescribe, here's how you do service discovery. I want to tell you how we're thinking about it, though. It's pretty good, huh? <laughs> so really, with the first big thing, I want to decouple my application from the back end. And I don't care if it's Zookeeper or etcd or Redis or MySQL or whatever. Like I want a layer in between this so that I can change things and fix things and manage that big, ugly, hairy state machine on the client side in one place instead of in thousands of places. And I, I want a team to be able to own that, and they own reliability, and they can put caching in place, or they can do sharding, or they can do any of these things in one place without doing them in thousands of places. And I don't want to have to scale my backend to scale my service, right? Like, if I run, if Twitter was initially on MySQL, if Twitter had only tried to scale MySQL, they never would have succeeded, right? We want to play the same game in service discovery. So we were here, remember, where we have these things kind of very tightly coupled with the backend, with Zookeeper. And I want to move to a model that's more like this. And this is you know, what we're working on at Buoyant right now. And I'd love to open source once we've used it in a little bit more anger. I'm not going to give it to you until I've been really mad at it. Uh, and so the first step, and this is something Twitter's already done, is to split registration outside of the process, right? Let me put that in a little like command line client that's just like, hey, I'm going to announce something, right? It's not tied to the liveness of the service, which is something we want. We want something that just registers. And so Twitter, this works directly on Zookeeper. But what I really want is a very constrained API there. So I actually have a service where I can manage this. I can change out the back end without touching any of this stuff. And this is, again, somebody can be on call for this thing instead of being on call for n thousands of these things. Similarly, on the read side, and this goes back to what Marius is talking about today, I don't want to say, give me this Zookeeper node. I want to say, I want to send requests to the user service. What's a user service look like? And let a name server give me name trees, you know, these things that are kind of these logical names, having a process to resolve logical names to these concrete clusters. Boom. Now we can do RPC. So the registration API is very constrained. Again, hide the backend semantics. And the one we've implemented is really simple. No hairy state machine. On the registration side, I, I don't need like ephemerality or like liveness or any of these session heartbeats that Zookeeper does. I want to say, hey, I'm alive here, and this service is great. Tell me again. And that's like a very, if this was on the read side, it'd be very similar to how DNS works, but this is kind of how I want to do registration. It's very flexible on the, on the right side. OK, now to talk about the read side. And finagle, finally. OK. So going back to what Marius was talking about, and I'm so pleased that he gave an intro to this, because it's been hard to rush through. Um, we have a logical name like a user service, and I have a whole bunch of concrete names. And in this case, I really want concrete names that are like this deploy of the service. These things should basically be immutable. I can scale them up, I can scale out my replicas up and down, but I want to say, here's my new version of this code, and whether it gets traffic or not is a routing decision, not a deployment decision. This really freezes up in a lot of ways. So to go in a name, we've seen this earlier today. We basically just create our client like that. I want to talk to the user service. 
I don't know if it's a staging service, or the prod service, or in Europe, or in Sacramento, or on my laptop. I just express this logical name. And this is actually maps to this. This is just a nice alias for using names. Uh, Marius's talk definitely explained that better. Similarly, we have some very simple delegation rules. I can say, when I talk about a service, I actually mean this environment, right? And I can layer these the way that Marius did earlier. So in this case, service users becomes this path, which is probably in Zookeeper, or whatever. Take a minute into the stack client. So Finagle's new, Finagle 6 clients uh, have this very nice stacking module which lets you replace features. I really, if you want to understand how Finagle clients work, that's the place to look. Uh, and then I want to highlight just three kind of big pieces of it. There's many more than I'm going to explain today. The binding factory is responsible for taking this logical name in the client and actually instantiating, like resolving this to a concrete name, to addresses actually, and binding to that. And so this uses vars uh, to, to manage the bottom half of the stack. And the bottom half of the stack is rebuilt as these names change, and the top half of the stack is not. Load balancing factory, so this builds a name tree, the kind of topology to think about how we route. Load balancing factory sits on top of that and chooses which requests go down which path of the tree. And the endpoint stack is rebuilt for each individual kind of address that gets put on there. Um, and so to just briefly show what we can do with this, uh, we can use these dtab rewrites, and this is a simple header that, HTTP, that Finagle HTTP supports today. And I can just add this rewrite rule into my client, and so instead of going to the prod user service, I now go to my user service. Easy, right? And this is the cool one. We talked about this before at our Hack Week project. I can also do crazy proxying rewrites. So I have now launched a little process that just takes some residual path like that, strips off some number of milliseconds from it, and then connects to the remote, right? And so here I now have a client that injects its latency purely through DTAB rules. Uh, this is a very, very powerful mechanism. I don't have time to really go into it today, uh, but I really encourage you to look into it. <laughs> um, and I really want to thank, this is not just me working on this by myself or just the CSL team working on this by ourselves. There's a lot of people at Twitter, and I'm sure I left some out. Uh, this is a big team effort over five years to do this stuff. And I really want to thank Will in particular, who made all these awesome images and I stole them. Finally, uh, at Buoyant, we're, uh, we're building a lot of this stuff, uh, taking these lessons we learned at Twitter and trying to build some products around this and release a bunch of this in the open source after we've, again, used it in anger. Um, so definitely you know, follow us or however you want to stay in touch. I uh, would love to keep in touch with you over time. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to field them. You're all tired. I get it. <laughs> this one? No. <laughs> okay. So real briefly, um, so this naming mechanism, and I totally glossed over this, so you're welcome to be confused. Uh, it actually supports residual paths. So every node doesn't have to resolve the full name. There may be some left over that says like, hey, I resolved a user service, right? And I have this extra bit that I didn't know how to resolve to a name. And so we end up with this yellow bit that's just sitting on the request. And this gets propagated through MUX. I've written some ways to propagate this through HTTP that's not really integrated in Finagle yet. Uh, but you can, in your protocol or in your client stack, um, have these residuals. They get, so this service now gets this thing kind of just sitting either as a header or a URI or something. And now it can interpret that. And so what this does is just like, take the rest of this name, the first thing's a number of milliseconds, the rest of it's my destination, and so you could have a generic proxy that's not bound just to the user service that can talk to any proxy, and just by rewriting these rules, I can cause it to route through that. Uh, so this becomes a very powerful debugging tool. You could use, you can do dtrace with this, you can do, you know, your distributed printfs through this. This becomes a really powerful tool. And the other thing to point out is that this propagates for the request context. Um, so, this is not like my request is going into the API here, and hop later is being affected. And anywhere that talks about the user service in this full request graph, even this is like very deep, will take these rewrite rules and it works in my proxy. Uh, it's a very powerful mechanism, and as Mario said today, is how staging at Twitter works now. Yes. Uh, two, two questions. 
Actually, yeah. I have two questions. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you're okay. So, uh, the first one is uh, you dropped in uh, your, we should, that you should have a separate uh, client to report. Yeah. Uh, because you don't want it to be able to be coupled to the license of your application. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. I, yes, you're right. I did just drop that. Um, Okay, so uh, the, what we want, we, we've kind of abandoned health checks and Twitter has abandoned health checks uh, because they're not a good indicator of liveness, right? E either I'm like, there is some latency in between it reporting its health. And what we found at Twitter is that most of our health check endpoints didn't actually indicate health of the service. The service, if it's sick, can't tell you it's sick generally. And they don't actually exercise the request paths. So what we really, like, I'm gonna hit some health check endpoints, like, yeah, the process is up but doesn't tell me if the like, request path that's actually going to go through the code is able to serve, if the caches are warm, if all the things that I need to serve requests. So we want Finagle's load balancer to make those decisions where it can actually do waiting decisions. And if you tune it properly with SLOs or with retries, you can actually achieve this without having health checks. And that, or at least that's the goal. This hasn't been totally proven out yet. That's kind of the aspiration there. The other issue we saw is that when this thing garbage collects, if the, if the Zookeeper session timeouts are small enough, you start really flapping up and down. And it's just like, new session, no session, new session. And that j session creation is actually very expensive in Zookeeper. And so that was another big motivator for moving this out. Does that clarify that somewhat? Yeah. Uh, and the second question was, uh, when you have Zookeeper, you can watch, can you still watch with your API? Uh, yes, so on this, on this name server, we need a watching API, right? On this read side, it has to be, um, how it's been implemented so far is long polling, uh, which is, I think, a fine way to do this if you tune your server properly. But yeah, you, you do need some watch mechanism, absolutely. Was there another question? Are we good? Right. Um, if, if the is hidden behind this name server, how to discover the name server? Ah, uh, yeah, the, the name server has to, like, just like Zookeeper, has to live somewhere predictably, right? Um, so, like, some people will say, oh, just use dynamic DNS, which is maybe an option. Uh, but Zookeeper exists on some well-known host port, and, and this has to as well. Um, it could, for instance, live on the Zookeeper servers themselves. All right, thank you so much.